talk. Yeah, everybody on it. Boss talk. It's a unique hustle. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECO and Emery with the lovely, amazing, official Mr. Jamaica. What's going on? Not, not you know my day. Walk on. I want y'all to stop what you're doing right now. Go like, subscribe, follow us on all social media platforms. When I mean all, I mean all. I mean your Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, you name it. We're on it. Just Google us, Boss Talk Podcast 101. We pop up first in line, I guarantee you. But if you want to see all our visuals, you got to go over to our YouTube channel. There you can see all our visuals. Don't forget to hit subscribe and hit that notification bell because you don't want to miss out on any of this fire content we're giving out every single day. But you know, we do have exclusive content and that only members can see. If you want to become a member today, all you have to do under each and every video, just like this one right here in the description section, there's a link that says join our membership. Click that link, follow all the instructions, and you'll become a member today and see all the exclusive content. And you will not regret it. Thank you in advance, and we love you. Man, check it, man. Hey, we down here in New Orleans, man. It's going down, man. We got a special treat for you in the building, man. Darius Diesel Harrison is in the house. What's going on? What's up, brother? What's happening? Man, it's, it's good to have you on the show, man. Appreciate the love, you know, the warm welcome uh, down here in New Orleans, man. It's a little rain. It's a, it's, it's a little Florida issue where it rains and stops a little bit. Not as much. But it's been no, not as much as South you know Florida. I do it. Yeah. Oh yeah, it, it ran, ran stop. It ran twenty minutes, then it stops. It's sunshine for twenty <laughs> minutes. Then you get nice and steamy, then it cool you down an hour later again with some more rain. Yeah, I used to live in Miami. So, so you understand? Yeah, yeah. Check it, man. Hey, Mr. Michael, man, let's go down through there on this young man. So let me ask you: Were you born and raised here in New Orleans? Born and raised here what? in New Orleans. What part? So I'm from Holly Grove coming home from the hospital to about six, seven years old. Then we moved to the east, way in Michu, where the mosquitoes, the kind that bite was this big, no. like an inch and a half for those who can't see my fingers. Uh -uh. Yeah, gators, wild hogs that'll chase you through the woods. So you wasn't um, scared of none of that stuff growing up? No, I had a machete. So have a wild hog ever so, tried yeah. to attack you as a kid? Yeah. But they stop once you pass the edge of the woods. They don't. They, ain't, they don't want to come out the woods. Oh, they don't. No, because people hunt them. Mm. That's how it used to be back in the day. I don't know if they really have them like that anymore. No, because they, of they got them. The human they, invasion. No, it's a lot of them, man. I just seen one just walking down the side of the road the other day. On Canal Street? No, not down here, but oh. in, Texas, <laughs> in Texas, where I work and stuff. Where I, oh, oh yeah, yeah, in Texas, like, oh, yeah. like they everywhere. Yeah. Like it's crazy. You would never see them back in the day. Yeah. Now you see them a lot more than you used to, and mm -hmm. so that mean they they don't grew and grew and grew. I guess. So. Yeah, they don't stop. They don't stop. Right. Well, let's get to it. So, um, were you um, raised by your mom and dad in the same household? Yep. That's a blessing. It is. Look how surprised she was your because your mom and dad is still together. Always. That's a blessing because right. you don't see that in the black home. Oh, homes. I know. Mm -hmm. Even 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 growing up, a lot of my cousins and friends didn't have both parents in the household, and I I know the difference that that made for me. You know, even though me and my daddy beefed a lot because we had the same personality. Yeah, I mean, he raised a him. So, you know, taking shit and, uh, I can curse on here. Just don't use the F word. Uh, for, <laughs> for Giados? There you okay. go. <laughs> you can, you can okay. say it that way. I can say it that way. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, he didn't, my dad didn't give a for Giado about what he said to anybody. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, my, my dad was one of them cats who would get out on the interstate with the pistol if you cut him off in traffic. And I used to be like, man, I don't know if you should, I, that's a bit extreme. Yeah, yeah. But he was also a Vietnam vet, you know, so. Oh, wow, so he was straight. Coming back from that. Right. Maybe you could see life a little differently mm -hmm. and not give a 4G auto about nothing. <laughs> and your mom so, and dad was from New Orleans as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it's cool. So, you know, my, you my family siblings? on my mom's side from, from Bunch Village, specifically Elm Street. Mm -hmm. So when the Freddy Krueger movies came out, I used to be spooked out as a child because my cousins used to like to watch the scary movies. And I didn't realize that it wasn't real when I was a kid. So we'd be on Elm Street. And I'm just expecting Freddy to pop out <laughs> from anywhere. So, I, you know, I, I wouldn't really sleep much because I'd be like, when Freddy come, I'm going to be ready for him. 
I slept with a butcher knife. <laughs> I just want to, you know, I, I know already down here, man, uh, uh, you guys went through a lot, man, when Katrina hit and all that. So, mm -hmm. uh, like, what, what did you do when, when that happened? Were you still, were you living here at that time? Yeah, I was living here. I had, so I got to see Katrina. I got to see the dichotomy of Katrina. I had my house slash studio in the hood, but then I had my other house on the west side of town where the others live because I was making a little bread so I was able to have two places and when the water started rising as the storm was coming in you could see how high it was up against the levee I looked on the TV I saw that the storm was the size of the Gulf of Mexico that's a big storm. That's a big storm. That's a big storm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you stayed? Hear me out. When I saw that on the news at 5.30 in the morning, because I didn't go to sleep, because I was like, let me see what's cracking with this storm, because I got kids. You know, I'm responsible for people, so I need to give out some orders on what to do and how to do it. So when I saw that, I was like, we getting the Forgiato out of here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So y'all pulled up. <laughs> yeah, we rolled out. But it took us nine hours to get to Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah, traffic. From wow. here. That's a two hour ride. It took us nine hours. There was people on the side of the road dying, cars broken down, out of gas. The whole night, because who expects to sit in traffic for nine hours? Yeah, wow. Even if you got a full tank you might not make it nine hours mm -hmm. just sitting. Yeah. So we left. As we were arriving in Jackson in the ninth hour, the telephone poles were snapping from the wind. The hotels, the gas station, nothing in the city had power. So you couldn't get gas. To check into a hotel, you had, they had to do it on paper. Yeah. And write down your information. And then when we checked into the hotel, it was like a horror movie. Cause the only thing that was lit up was the exercise at the end of the hallway. It was like The Shining. Wow. Yeah. And all you hear was babies crying, people screaming, couples arguing, it's hot. You can't, if you close your door, your room gonna be so hot because you can't open the windows because they didn't open. The AC wasn't running because the power was off, no lights. So then when you crack your door, you don't know somebody, somebody could come in, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Somebody could come in. So, and you had your kids with you. And I had my kids with me. Man. So I cracked the door, but I put the sofa in front of the door and was on the sofa, you know, just standing guard. Yeah. Cause I had babies and it was like the, the room was so hot, the windows was dripping with steam just from body heat and stuff like that. What time of the year is this again? This is, is now. This September? Ugh. Oh no, July? August. August, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's approaching. Did mm. you, okay, when that happened, you guys go and just fast forward a little bit. I know it was a lot of detail in there, mm. but once everything settles, how long before you come back to New Orleans? Well, we, we weren't allowed to come back. So For how my, long? House, my house in the hood flooded. It had 13 feet of water in it. My house on the white side of town was fine. Okay. Yeah. And Of course. Of course. And the water was spilling over on the levees on that side of town because they had small, like, six-foot levees. On our side of town, the levees is, like, 20 feet and probably... Two maybe three hundred feet from point to point at the base. You know how much land that is. Mm. So some of my friends were here. The same guys who were on the bridge that they accused of shooting at helicopters. They were out in that area and they said they heard four big booms. Dynamite. Yeah. So they broke and then the here come the water. So they bust. They broke. Yeah, the they broke them. I heard those stories. I mean, they broke the mother. Frank and Curtis. Yeah, so, <laughs> but I, I, you always hear that 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 was a, yeah, that, that was I done purposely. And, yeah, of course, bro. 
And of course. It, and, and that's the bad part about it because, so the storm didn't even break the levees. The, the storm broke the flood wall because, but that's over by the night wall. The storm broke the flood wall because a barge hit the, the, a barge hit the flood wall. Wow. Yeah, and that's just concrete. So if a heavy metal shipping boat runs and slams into a wall, of course it's gonna crack concrete. Concrete really ain't that hard. That's right. Yeah, and you hit it right, it's cracking. Cause it's not malleable. It can't, it can't work with you. Yeah. It's just what it is. Wow. But so, the levees, oh, no, I apologize. No, go ahead, the levees. The levees were ruptured more than likely by human mm -hmm. design. Tampering, right? Yeah, a little tamperage. <laughs> But how long did it take for you to before you came back home? So I was in Atlanta for three months. Because you had one house that was fine, so you should have been able to come back home they to that still, house. They, they wouldn't let people go into that area. Even the one they that was fine. They were protecting it. The one that was fine. They were protecting Even that area. Even if you showed them that you with had the a National house Guard. There. Yeah, they, you couldn't go back. Mm. You just had to wait. Had, how long? Nash, uh, three months. Three months. Yeah. Okay. So you came back right after the three months. I didn't come back to live. I she stayed in Atlanta. I came back to check on my stuff. Correct. My three classic cars were gone. Wow. Somebody flatbedded them out of my driveway. I had a 63 Coupe de Ville, all original. I had a 55 Chevy Bel Air that me and my pops built. And I had a 73 and a half 442 with the swivel seats. It was all, my driveway was empty. They even took my engine hoist and my engine stand. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> so when they took this, you never seen them cars again? No. Never. They took it all, I had to take it out of New Orleans because... Oh, it's probably somebody, it, you would think it, 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 you would think it was somebody this was looked like you, but it probably wasn't. It probably wasn't. Yeah, because so you know who loved those cars. Yeah. 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 And that was yeah, in your, was, in a neighborhood that was protected. No, that, that was those. in the hood. Oh, that was, why did you keep that, those car in the hood? Because I had room in my driveway. Mm. You I got it, okay. I got it. You had room in your driveway. Yeah, I had a long driveway, so I could fit those three cars. My driveway in my other house was in, um, it was like condos, so I couldn't just have my cars over there because it wasn't enough space. But, you know, it took like three months to come back um, to check on my stuff, and then I went back to Atlanta and, and refigured out life and, you know, and working with people and making music and ended up getting that part cracking. Wow. So when you think about just um, the way that 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 it redeveloped this city, mm. where do you do you how do you look at it now? It's it's a it's bittersweet because so many of us were dying and being murdered, and there was so much of that going on, but the culture was still super rich and, you know, and effective and, and just super authentic. Now, okay, let's take, I heard you mention Birdman earlier. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah for sure. So the neighborhood, so he grew up one house away from my sister-in-law. Okay. On Valence. VL. Ferret and VL now has uh, outdoor taco eating and people walking little dogs that crap on the sidewalk, you know. And it's cool because it rejuvenated the area, but we have lost ownership of the things that we own. So mm -hmm. they did that. Per so purposely, it was recent. Gentrification. I would say so. I mean, the Hawaii fires. Come on, burn them out. They gonna have to figure their life out. They, they, what are they gonna do? Leave the island? Wow. Probably not. They gonna have to figure something else out. And how does the fire burn that long with live trees and all that water right there? Uh, it's not dry like LA. No. 
It's lush green land. So it's basically plot. You feel like it's a plight behind it. It's beachfront property. Mm. It, it's, it's worth something. It's worth something. And if you got poor people living on this beachfront, poor people, because that's actually rich to me, living on beachfront property and being able to grow your own fruit and vegetables and eat off your land, that's wealth. Damn mm -hmm. right it is. Yeah. And that's some good volcanic land with a lot of nutrients and you can grow anything. I was in, I was in LA and I met the chief of, um, of one of the islands. I, I think it might have been Kauai, maybe. His name was King Pa. He was telling me about how he grows food on his land and he just feed all his people. He grows oranges, bananas, apples. He has livestock and his people eat for free with him. If they need something, they just come and they pick the fruit and, and, they, and he feeds them just off the land. It don't cost him nothing. It just grows, it's healthy, it's, it's real. You ain't even gotta say organic, it's real. And he feeds his people just off the land. So why, if I'm, if I'm a greedy person, why wouldn't I burn you out? That's real, that's real. Um, but I had a question about that, but then when they do these things and they burn them out or um, the levy comes out, all of these people, they, do they own the properties that they were living on? I owned my house. I had to sell my house in the hood. Because at that point, to sell? My, my income had stopped. Mm. I couldn't afford to live in, I, in I couldn't places. afford to keep my other house that I had, figure out what to do with that house because the insurance company played us. Yeah, Flood told me that homeowners need to pay for it because I had a hole in my roof because the wind blew my roof off. But the homeowner said that because I had a, I mean, Flood said that because I had a hole in my roof, it rained in my house and that's why my house flooded. So I went through that for six months of mm. being on the phone eight hours, eight hours a day with them. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. They always look, because with all of the expenses they had, they were always looking for a loophole that they could try to get exactly. out of Exactly, and that was the loopholes, but they were both responsible. So they ended up settling with me, which mm -hmm. was a loss for me. But at that point, I'm like, my house is sitting there molding and rotting. I still need to pay for it to fix it. So I ended up selling my house for way less than the value it was before the storm. Right. Because it was, it was severely damaged. You know, um, so most people, because they needed the money, it they don't sell. Well, yeah, they can't afford right. to live in two places and pay right. two mortgages or two, you know, that's the middle class in New Orleans wasn't like that. Right at that time. Black people was doing good and affluent. The East was popping, the East was fly, it was thriving, you know, Uptown was popping, other areas was popping, but to be to have to one, find a new job or a new method of getting income in a new city that you're not from and may not know and may not have resources. Right. And pay two mortgages, pay for your children's school, pay, pay for your cars, your insurance, health care, all of that, that's a lot. Wow. So of course a lot of people sold their properties. They had to. Wow, I'm gonna pull you out of that because I gotta get to this music, man. Come on, let's do and it. I, and and when, I, when I say names, mm -hmm. uh, when I say Drake, because he's been going through so much mm -hmm. with, uh, um, but he, he, he ties, he, he loved coming down to New Orleans and all that and linking with you guys. He got like, a lot. Like, what, uh, what, what, what do you think about Drake? What comes to mind? What comes to about mind? About Drake? Yeah. Because you guys are- Okay, you, first of all, he's a great artist and talent. Super intelligent. To me, he's always been kind and nice. So my perspective on him, I mean. You guys did some stuff together? So the first record that him and Willow Wayne ever did, called I'll Take Your Girl, yeah, was a record that me and my little homie KC produced. Okay. Yeah. Then 
DJ Black and Mile. Yeah, yeah, shout out to him. He yeah. just on the show. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah that's, I was with him yesterday. Yeah, I, I was too. Oh okay. Yeah, but we was probably at a different time. Was you at the Birdman thing over there? Just no, I was at the jazz camp. Yeah, mentoring youth uh, for the for the Jazz and Heritage Foundation. Okay, so that yeah. probably was what time was that? From eight to two. Yeah, yeah. he came after that. He came, he came after that, yeah, because we was yeah. there all day together. Yeah, yeah. So, um, because we both mentor youth and youth, that's dope. Yeah, yeah I like super that. dope, man. Um, and they really appreciate it. But Black did uh, In My Feelings, in which they sampled Lollipop. Okay. Which automatically made me a co author on that record. So, I can't be mad at Drake. <laughs> you know no, what I'm saying? No, 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 it's a, me. A song that did a billion streams right out the gate. Thank you, Drake. Wow. I appreciate it. But but he's a super dope talent. And, you know, with all that stuff with him and Kendrick and stuff like that, like rap beef, I'm from, I'm 50, bro, this year in October. So people mama, they grandma, like, Ain't that against the code? Yeah, but the code didn't change since we were young, brother. Yeah, it's a different code. Yeah, they don't care. I, that's, I don't like that code. You don't like that new code? Nah. nah. So, because what my what my grandma got to do with you, bro? Leave my grandma alone, man. Leave my leave my mama out. Well, once they once they you know unless my mom and pointed a pistol at you, like leave her out of it. It's bad because once they get a kill or something, they go to grave sites and all kind of stuff. Now these young people do different. ridiculous it's stuff. Different, yeah, you know, um, and I think and I feel like that's a that's that's something that is caused by the lack of two parent households where because we really need that as a culture because you got sons yeah but growing up you say you're almost 50 but growing up when you were younger there was a lot of not two parent households there around, were but people weren't being that disrespectful back then because well, we were coming out of the effects of having respect and which was great, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like you respected your grandmother, you respected your aunts, your uncles, you know, even, even the ones that you didn't want to, you still had some kind of honor for them. And you know, that was a result of, of us having to stick together in the 50s and 60s to make it. Mm-hmm. And then, in my opinion, because we had a certain level of respect for ourselves. I just, like I said, when, when I think about just the way that you look at the music today and then, you know, that, that even Drake from the time he started to now, mm-hmm. it's a different Drake. You know that. Well, yeah, totally. So everything changes, man, and everything evolves. But I get mm-hmm. it. It took a turn for the worst when you do the certain things that are out of the element. Right. But let me ask you, like, how mm-hmm. did you first get into music? I didn't ask that. So I was nine years old. No, I was I was five. And that my, young? Yeah. I knew from that young. I was five, my favorite uncle was a bass player. The hit record out at the time was Another One Bites the Dust. Man, that was so, no one, didn't it? Yeah. Doom, 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 So peep it. My uncle, because he was off during the day and he did gigs at night, during the summer, he was able to babysit me and my cousin, who was the same age as me. So we would be chilling, and then it would be time for him to practice. So he'd be like, okay, y'all come you know, come sit in the room so I could watch y'all while I practice. So he would sit us on the edge of the bed, me and my cousin Tanya, and he had this, uh, he would have a cigarette in his mouth. So he'd light a cigarette, he'd be like, man, that cigarette looked kind of wrinkled. Like it, <laughs> it don't look like the cool filth of kegs. So he light a cigarette. Y'all get he would blow it in our face. And then he said, okay, y'all sit here. I'm going to go stand over here across the room and practice. And we'd be like, okay. So we sitting there, high as cheese. He's standing there across the room. Well, he got the... He got the the can go tilted to the side, his shades on, 
the J in his mouth, a white Fender bass, P bass, with the, with the shirt on, with the V deck and the, with the chest hairs out. That's, what they want. That's how they did it. You yeah, talking yeah, the 70s, yeah, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on now. And then he started practicing. Dum, dum, dum. The dum, 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 the dum. So I would be like, every time that happened, I'd be like, this the coolest nigga ever. That's what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> so at five, I knew I wanted to be a musician. I knew I wanted to make records. But I didn't get that opportunity until I was nine when a band director came to our class in elementary school. And he looked like he was from the circus. He had the mustache that went like that. He had an all white suit on, white shoes, white shirt, white tie, and a trumpet. And he said, who wants to play music? Raise your hand. So boom. I was like, this is my opportunity right here. So I raised my hand. We walk off through this area past the gym of the schoolyard where we weren't supposed to go. It was like shrubs and a pathway. And when you look to the right, there was a cottage. We walk in the cottage, there's instruments everywhere. There's drums, there's saxophones, there's trumpets, there's trombones, bass drums, tubas, you name it. So they go through every instrument and say, who wants to play this instrument? They will make the sound, you know, somebody will play it. And then somebody played the saxophone. And I was like, that's what I want to play. Because I was hearing Grover Washington in my house. Oh. Why like, so I was like, yeah, chicks like saxophone. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna play. At nine. At nine, yeah, come on, baby. He trying to think about them girls. Yeah, you know, I gotta procreate. <laughs> I, I had kids to make. So, um, so yeah, that's when I started. And then I ended up, you know, winning all the first place in all the Louisiana Music Educators, which is LMEA competitions, wow. playing in symphonic bands and orchestral bands and, um, then going to St. Aug and becoming drum major. We played the Super Bowl halftime show in well, 91. 91? Yeah, 91 when it was here. Wow. Yeah. So. How many instruments can you play now? I don't play saxophone anymore. I sing, I rap in English and Spanish. Um, I play bass, I play guitar, play a little keys. I play enough keys for my records. Mm -hmm. But um, But yeah, so then you know, I put the horn down and started singing and that turned into vocal production and songwriting and... You say you can sing. Can you sing me a little song right now? Yeah. I want to hear some. You ready? You ready? My darling, I can't get enough for your love, baby. Girl, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know why. I can't get enough for your love, baby. Oh, okay. I like I like the way you took it to your cause it really went like oh I can no 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 the no, no, deep yeah. <laughs> I just sang that with the orchestra really? on GMT. Yeah. that's crazy yeah. man that who, who, that was uh, my boy that was that, Barry White that nigga deep it ain't no he, yeah right. he, he was one of the ones yeah man. he was one of the ones what made y'all pick that song well I mean it's a hard song for sure but yeah but my voice been like this since I was thirteen <laughs> you was on it yeah so. Man. And when the Deeper Soul, thank you sister, asked me to perform with the orchestra, the Louisiana Philharmonic, she was, we were talking last year. She was like, your voice deep. And I said, this is how I talk. She was like, can you sing? I was like, yeah. She was like, you wanna sing Barry White for my show next year? Oh, damn. And I was like, sure. I just did a Barry White cover. And she was like, yeah, I'm gonna get you to sing Can't Get Enough For Your Love. And boom, we did it. Wow. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a stick to the music with you. I know we on it. No, no, but, let's keep it going. But, um, so after that, fast forwarding, Donald Harrison, alto saxophone player who mentored Biggie Smalls, trombone shorty, John Baptiste, um, Christian Scott, me and a host of other people, and who's also my big chief of the Congo Nation wow. Indian tribe here, he 
gave me the game on how to really be professional in the music business and have a professional sound and how to really put stuff together. And he told me a very important secret one day when I was frustrated trying to put a part in a song on the keyboard in one of my tracks. He was like, hey, what you doing? I said, man, I'm trying to get this part. He was like, stop. I said, okay, hold up, D. I almost got it. He was like, stop. I said, I said, hold up, hold up, I, I, I almost got it. He said, stop. <laughs> so I turned around, I was a little frustrated, but you know, this is my OG, this is my mentor, so I turned, I listened. He said, look, man, the music will always tell you what it needs. All you have to do is listen. And I was like, ah, okay. <laughs> Good point. Because I wasn't listening. I was too busy Trying to do talking. what you want to do. Yeah, right. too busy trying. So then that bit of information put me in a position to create better product. And then I ended up getting a call from Slim. And I thought it was a joke. Because... I didn't know Slim, I knew who Slim was. And I didn't think that Slim knew who I was. You know, cause they was, they was super popping mm -hmm. and we had never had any interaction. Even though they grew up one house away from my sister-in-law, my brother's wife. So my phone rings, I'm in my studio working away. My phone rings and my wife at the time, she says, um, there is, uh, somebody's on the phone for you. He says he's slim from Cash Money. And I was like, you know, I'm thinking it's one of my friends, Joe, me, like playing around. So I said, tell whoever that is when they're serious about business, call me back and stop playing on my phone and hang up on him. And she was said that verbatim, and then she hangs up on him. Mm -hmm. The phone rings right back. He said, please tell him it's really me. And she was like, babe, he said it's really him. So now I'm frustrated, which also taught me a lesson. I go, I go to the phone, I'm like, hello? He go, hey man, it's Slim. And I was like, oh shit, it is him. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it is him. So after that, I was like, my bad, bro. I, you know, I'm thinking somebody playing on my phone. And he goes, I want you to come over to the house. He gave me the address in the neighborhood that they was in. And I knew that neighborhood because I had some friends that lived there. And I was like, wow, this really happening. And the day I showed up was the day that I worked on my first number one record, which was a remix with Wayne and Levant. That song they did together, I don't even remember the name of the song, but you know the record I'm talking about? Yeah. This only song that Wayne and Levant have it together. only had one, and yeah. I can't even think of it. I can't I think of it, but it was... Look it up. It was, uh, ah, it was a cold song, too. I just can't you remember. You produced it? No, I didn't produce it. I engineered Wayne's vocals and did the vocal production on that song. Can you song sing a part of it? Wayne. You don't I know. I can't remember it. it. You don't know I, that song. I, I kind of hear it in my head, but I don't, I don't remember it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've done thousands of songs right. since then. But that was you my- You know what? Hmm? It was called You Know What? Oh yeah, You Know What. <laughs> yep. That's it. Yep. So, um, so yeah, after that, it just was number one, number one, because Wayne was on everybody's remixes and all that stuff. So then it was Destiny's Child, Soldier. Then it was T.I. Then it was, uh, I can't even remember. Which one so, you did with T.I.? Stand Up. No, not. Yeah, stand up. Huh? No, you Luda, Luda had a stand up, but T.I. Right. have a stand up too. T.I. had one that said, if you don't like what I'm saying, then mm -hmm. bug. Swing on them niggas, we can throw them hands, sucker. That was him and BG. That was him and BG. That wasn't him and Wayne. That wasn't him and Wayne. Yeah. They had so a couple records with it? him and Wayne. They had a it few. Was, it was on... Um, it was stand up. It was stand up, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you, brother. Yeah, <laughs> it was stand up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. sure was. Yeah. You right. Yeah, so I just looked it up. Yeah, you right. So you know, I got I had engineering credit on that one, and I, it just 
it went on and on and on. So by the time we released the Birdman Fast Money album, which I did six of the records on and engineered the whole thing, I had already touched probably 15 to 20 number one records. Mm -hmm. So, you know, under my belt. Is there any of the 15 to 20 that came to you as a surprise? All of them, at that point. Because <laughs> that was my first year working with them. Mm -hmm. So, I had done professional things before, but to just do it consistently back to back, back, back. like that, I was, I was really surprised because you never knew what was going to happen what day because they was getting so many calls from people for features and to be on stuff or to do collaborations. Right. So, you know, one day it's a Vance record. Next thing you know is, like I said, Destiny's Child. And next thing you know, Tina Marie walks in the door. You know, Man. I got a funny story about that. Well, that's hard. So Go ahead. Tina, with her little bit of self, walks in the room. Cause Baby and them had told me that the night before that Tina was coming, so I did two tracks for her to be prepared. And she walks in the room, and Baby was like, "Play what you did for," her. and then he left the room. So I I played one of the tracks, and she walked up to me. She stopped the computer. She walked up to me. Now she's like right here to me, but she's this close to me. And I'm looking down at her, and she's looking up at me. She said, you did this for me? And I said, yeah, they told me you were coming in today, so I wanted to have some stuff, some ideas for you ready. And she said, you know what Rick would have called this? And I said, what? She said, Big Dick Funk. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, Big Dick Funk it is. <laughs> that's hard. Yeah, that's hard. She was, she she did the song. It was called The Love Game. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, after that, we did, what, Carter One uh, was happening at that time. And I engineered like 90% of that record. Um, but I didn't have any productions on it. But I was engineering, you know, for Wayne and for Manny. Um, then the Carter Two, I ended up having production on and did a lot of the vocal production on it and engineered probably about 75% of that album. Wow. And then, uh, yeah, you probably know the record. It was called Wheezy Baby. Yeah. The one. That's you. Yeah. I gave him a West Coast record. Like if you listen to that, cause he didn't have anything like that on the album. He had all them other records, but you know, I, I, yeah. yeah. So that one, then uh, all the mixtapes, the droughts, Louisiana, all that stuff. Uh, the gangsters don't die record. Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. Gangsters don't die to get chubby and they move to Miami. That's me. Um, uh, so many more. Oh, I, I gotta do. ask this part. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, um, out of, okay, with all your records that you've engineered and stuff, without your tag being anywhere on it, how would someone know that that was you? Because everybody still has something that's unique to themselves other than a tag in their music. So, my sonic tag is quality. Okay. But a lot of like, a lot of engineers say they give quality as well. Yeah, but I'm talking about as a producer. Mm-hmm. Like you gonna know it's mine because high hit, it's it's crispy, it's it's my stuff still sounds analog even though I'm using digital stuff. Really? Yeah, because I grew up on analog stuff, so. So you go for that sound. Yeah, I get that sound. Wow. And, and it. It resonates with humanity a certain way. What about Chris Brown? Yep, Time for Love. I worked on that record as a co-producer and co-writer um, with uh, Jean Baptiste and Free School. Okay. Who do a lot of, lot, a lot of hits, pop, rap, 
whatever you name it, alternative. Um, How did you get to be a part of that record? They called me. Jean was like, hey, these come to the studio. Okay. Let's, you know, we're working on Chris Brown. And it was a jam. And it was like that simple. What's your favorite out of all the ones you've ever done? Is Records? There any, is there any hmm. one favorite that you can say that? So let the, let the Beat Bill is one of my favorites because it's so, like, I'm gonna say awkward because it ain't no regular record. You know, there's, it don't start off with a, with drums and a, and a beat, it starts off with just a sample and rapping. And it, the intensity builds for so long that by the time the beat actually dropped and when the hook dropped, it was such a surprise for people that that's what he was gonna say. This how you let the beat build? Who says that? Nobody, nobody ever said that on no record. Mm -hmm. The record was, okay, intro, beat, Drums, music, oh. all that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So it was it was a creative way to do something that had never been done, but that was completely palatable for people to understand it and grasp it and be surprised by it. So when some people was like, yo, Diesel, what is that? I'm talking about executives. Um, from, you know, the majors. They were like, what is this? I was like, it's a classic hip hop record. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, they didn't know. They didn't know. Same happened with Miss Officer. They didn't know. Same happened with Miss Officer. And that's, all that is is a jazz record. That's jazz chords, sevens and nines on guitar, played over a bounce beat, but not with the bounce sounds. On that song, man, did you know Kid Kid was gonna be on there? Yeah, I'm the reason he was on there. Why didn't they never do a video with him on there? That would have been hard, bro. I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like that maybe that was some- Your fault? Whatever. No, that wasn't my fault. No, no, nah, 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 that's my dude. That's a good joke, though. That's a good joke. Nah, that's my dude. I, 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 I love Kid Kid, man. I got, I got records. I love Kid Kid ever since I met him. He yeah. Did, yeah, he been on with That's my dude, stuff. bro. I rock with New Orleans, yeah, man. he do. Yeah. I appreciate that. All y'all, man. Yeah, man. The Texas and Louisiana for Right, me. connection. I can't see my favorites, so, oh, yeah, you know, you got to realize he Texas and Louisiana. Right. So the record on uh on Fast Money with Bun on it? Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. I worked on that record, too. Wow. Yep. That's uh, hard. But, so somebody else was supposed to be on that record and they had done oh, well, their verse. Kick hit. Yeah, they had done their verse. But when they did their verse, it's, it was the same thing that Wayne said, except they changed the words. But it was still the same subject matter, same timing, same, same spot in the verse. And I asked, I asked Fizzle, Wayne, I said, you hear this? And he said, hear yeah, what? He said, man, homie, verse time. He's saying, he's saying all the stuff you, you said, he just changed the words. But his verse is the same as your verse. He was like, what? And I said, yeah, listen. He was like, oh, nah, we got to take that off. And then. It was a popular artist. Not that popular at the time. But the guy was a Wayne fan. So he. He was mimicking Wayne's style on his own records. You know, which is cool, hey, that's your favorite rapper. Yeah, you're gonna do it. Learn from him, you're gonna do that. But when we took that verse off, Kid Kid was in the cut waiting. And Wayne was like, nut, cause we call him nut for peanut. Wayne was like, yo nut, you got something for this? He was like, yeah. He went there and did it. And then that, that, next thing you know, the whole world was, my face on every wanted poster. He went in. Going by every lady cop all rap, over. Yeah, he could rap. Straight New Orleans, man. That's what they don't understand. He really 
It's in him, man. Yeah, super. <laughs> super. It's in him, bro. I, like, I did, so this record called All On Me. It's all on me. I do my dirt on my lonely. Most niggas fake and phony. How my child gonna eat? Me and my dog riding on E. Um, ain't got no money, man. How we supposed to eat? Like, he he really is a dope lyricist. Yeah, for sure. And a dope rapper. And a dope person, man. Tell me a little bit about J-Lo, man. I see you. She... Look like heaven in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> so I spent like a month at her house working on, what? on her album. Hold yeah, because we was all, yeah, it was a crew of us. <coughs> Excuse me. It was a crew of us working on that AKA record. Shout out to my brother Pop, big one up. Um, we were working on her record and we were doing it at her studio in Hidden Hills in uh, California. <coughs> so, you know, we get there early, cause she's an early riser. So we get there early, but like eight o'clock, call time for session. She would come to the gym to work out, which is where <clears throat> you got, we go to the gym. She would come to the gym, which is where my rig was set up. Cause I had all my own equipment at a crib. <clears throat> and she walk in, Thank you. Like, fresh off the pillow, like just brushed her teeth and pulled her hair back. And walk in the gym, looking like an angel. I mean, like fire glowing, fine. So, I mean, how was she? Pleasant. Mag magnificent eye candy. Oh yeah, you had yeah. a good time. Yeah. Every and day was cool. cool. Super cool. Super cool. Yeah, like Jenny from the block. Cool. Which rock, which what, what was the song that you guys produced with J Lo? Well which what was well, some of the songs? I worked on most of the album. Okay. In pieces. So I don't even remember the song titles, because that was twenty fourteen. I've done probably, you know, two thousand songs since then at least. Um, but the whole album, like if you see, if you look at the credits, I'm thanked in the credits for the holistically, wow. not just per song. Because I didn't have any singles on there, nothing like that. Yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, it was, a, it was great. She was kind and genuine yeah. and authentic. That you, know. you don't, it's hard to find that in this industry. A lot, a lot of times, times. Yeah. especially with somebody so, so, successful and so popular, you know. Did you ever run, I'm, I'm gonna jump subjects on you right quick. Right. When it come down to Soldier Slim and, and, and him being down here in that movement with, with, back in the day, which went between different cash money and, Bro, and, and uh, No Limit. I never got the opportunity to work with Slim. Did you ever get a chance to, um, did you hear some of his music? Of did course. You, do you know I, his legacy down here in New yeah, Orleans? Yeah. You know? So my little cousin, Currency, Man, that's your cousin. That's my cousin. Yeah, I've been trying to get him on the show. Vaugh, shout out to Vaugh, man. You know, yeah. he ain't, yeah, he ain't made it happen yet, but he say he gonna make Vaughn, it. Vaughn get he it gonna, done he for He's gonna make he it gonna happen. It he for. says it's a building. They, I hear it's close by where I'm at. They got yeah, some kind of set up. His shop is close. His uh, jet light store is close by. That's hard. That's hard. Yeah, but um, I knew most of what I knew about Slim, him personally, because. Like currency would tell me about Slim all the time, and he w he wanted to introduce us. It's funny because Slim's mother lived on the same street that my house was on. Wow! When Katrina happened, my studio house, but it was closer. To, it was probably like maybe three quarters of a mile up, like more toward like the ninth ward. Like closer to Gentilly Boulevard. I don't know if you know the, how in the world you know the city, but yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was interesting how we never met. But like Danny Cartel, who did uh, slow motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were in the same circles, but me and Slim just never happened to meet. Wow. You know? and, he, and yeah, it was it was interesting. But I always liked his stuff, and I. Like the authenticity that he had in his music, you know. I never even got to meet him, actually. 
Wow. Yeah. Did you, I see you mentioned uh, Cash Money. Did you ever get to work with any of No Limit? So, yeah. So, after Cash Money, I ended up uh, some years later being in LA and working with No Limit at that time, working okay. with P at that time, like 2013, somewhere okay. around that. So, me and Ranch from 1500 or nothing did the Al Capone record together. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I did some Silk records and shout out to Silk. That's yeah, my guy. To Silk. That's, that's my, my guy boy, right there. Man. Yeah, that's yeah. a good dude, bro. Yeah, he sharp as a he yeah. sharp. He yeah. sharp. People yeah. don't realize how sharp he is. Yeah, <laughs> he's real. super sharp. Yeah, well, we, yeah. Did, we had some interesting conversations. Yes, us too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's yeah. super sharp. He knows sharp. stuff that other people are not going to touch. That whole body of work when right. it comes to humane. Yeah, so totally. that's different. Totally. You know what I mean, and that's where it started to be something that can affect the world. Yeah, you, I'm, I'm going there. I don't want to take it that way. Nah, that's, that's real. <laughs> Silk is that is that that guy? Yeah, he's that guy. So, okay, and 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 I get it. Like like you guys got different wards and everything down here. Mm. Like like you when you first seen you guys come up, man. Y'all mm. had so many different places where. Where people was hanging out, this mm -hmm. whole that whole bounce movement, uh -huh. all that stuff come from down here, man. And you managed to find your way, producing, you know, mm -hmm. dealing with music, different yeah. bilingual. You know, mm -hmm. that's a little different for me. I hadn't talked to nobody down here that right. was in the bilingual <clears throat> market. Like, you, you do, when you tap into that market, is it is it promising? Does it bring back? Well, yeah. So, okay, the way I got into that is because. I liked a variety of music. So when I heard Lionel Richie, all night long. Come on, all night. Boom, 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 all boom, night boom, 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 long. Boom, boom, yeah. And then Sheila E. Man. That was it. Yeah. And she was playing them timbales and stuff. Yeah. I used to be like, man, what? <laughs> like, you know, why we don't have drums like that? in our music. So I would do my research and find other Latin artists and stuff like that. And then I got invited to this spot that used to be open called Twi Ropa. It was a factory, but they used to have Latin nights there. And then, you know, when, uh, what, I can't remember the, Exact people, but you know, you look on you look on certain movies and stuff, and they had a Latinas in the movie, and we didn't grow up with them in our neighborhoods because it wasn't mixed like that. They were out in the, in Kenner in the West, but you know, I used to be like, where they at? Because yeah. you know, I need a little salsa on. <laughs> so yeah. I'd go to Twi Rope, and they was doing salsa because I used to dance too. I did ballet. What? Yeah. You up on your toes? Is that how they go? No, you picking yeah, up, nah, you picking you up, up women. Yeah, no, you on your toes too, though. You, 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 you on your toes you, you and you, you spinning around with the women up in there. They coming down. Oh, you did all that? Yeah. Damn, you had them spandex on. That's Why? the part right there, man. The yeah. spandex is different. That's an art. Yeah, it's an art. <laughs> why, but why did you choose to get into that? Because I didn't want to. I didn't. I didn't want to play football and be in a pile of dudes. That's hard. I wanted to go to, a, I got asked because I was muscular and they needed some dudes to carry a chariot because the teacher was being Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. So you know how they had a muscle dudes carrying the, okay. the chariot. But then when I got there, because initially I was like, I was like, man, hell no. When my, my homegirl asked me and she was like, she was like, Darius, just all we need you to do is carry a chariot. You could, we gonna, you gonna wear loose pants and all that. And I was like, man, don't call me and ask me no shit like that. So then she goes, uh, I hang up on her. But then I thought about it. And I called back. And I said, hey, what time you need me there? And she was like, you serious? I was like, yeah. She was like, class at six o'clock. I said, I could wear my basketball shorts. <laughs> so yeah, whatever you want. So I show up with my basketball shorts and my t-shirt on, and I walk into class, just like I thought. 
it was a class full of females who could put their feet behind their head with no problem. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, a lot of people, a lot of people would, um, I That's remember all. growing up, they would look at males, uh, especially if they're in ballet or gymnastics uh, and stuff, and they'd be like, oh, they gay. Well, that's what I thought, too. But when I showed up, I knew I wasn't. That's and I real. knew why I showed up. I had, a, I had an intention. But then after that, I realized that it was actually a dope art form. It made me stronger. It made me more agile. Because I was also studying Muay Thai and kickboxing. Yeah. So it made my sport, for me, it made me better at my sport. Because I was flexible. My body was... I was able to move. I had more self, I had more control. And then I ended up really liking the art form. And then you know what I ended up learning later? What's that? One of the most respected rappers in the world did ballet. Pop. Tupac. I knew that. Yeah. Well, I gotta, and before I get y'all here, cause I'm finna have to get y'all here, but right. um, I gotta get this out. Uh, Manny Fresh, who seemed to shape the sound in New uh -huh. Orleans. Like, yeah. Did you, have you ever got a chance to work with him? And also, just what do you think about him as a producer in coming out of these parts? Bro, so Carter One, I was recording most of Manny's beats into the, you know, into the Pro Tools and stuff. And so yes, I worked on that whole album with him. Uh, the Carter Two was a lot of different producers, but I worked, you know, with Manny on some of that. Um, on the Fast Money album, and he had, Manny had like, I want to say like two records maybe, but I worked with him on that. And <clears throat> uh, Manny was always at my older brother's house. So it was more than just, you know, work. He, he would be at my brother's house for family functions and stuff like that. So we would just be kicking and playing pool and, and ribbing, like, which is cracking jokes on each other. Um, yeah, so as far as his sound is concerned, I would venture to say that you can't, it's hard to nail down what Manny's sound is because every, every time he do a beat, it's fresh, it's new, it's, you know, he using different elements. And that was a part of, watching him was a part of why I did things the way I did it because I'm like, he's not typical. He ain't typical, he not doing just this one thing. He's taking all kind of different vibes, like hood rat chick. Bum, 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 bum. That's not rap music if you really, you know, if you think, if you think rap, you're not gonna think that, you're not gonna think project chick, you know what I'm saying? That was fire. That nigga bad. Bad water. Gator boots Man. and a pimped up Gucci suit. Thank God. No on, job. Yeah, that, that boy was different, man. Yeah. Like I said, um, I would love to hear some more, a lot more music okay. from, from Manny, you know. Yeah. Um, definitely would love to see, love to hear that happen, man. Love the Louisiana sound, man. I want to thank you for coming on Boss Talk 101. I appreciate man. you, brother. Man, you did a dope job, man. The history, man. Thank New you. Orleans, I feel like I, you know, this here interview right here really put me on point with New Orleans. I'm here. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, yeah. it ain't nothing to play with when it come down to the history and you. So, right. we're going to probably be bagging this thing up doing another one. Okay. You know, I'm um, with it. I'm going to bring you to Dallas, though. We got to do something in the D, man. I love the D. You know what I'm talking about? Town. <laughs> The details, the details. Thank you, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. We're gonna end on that Boss note, man. Say, baby. man, it's been another great segment <laughs> yeah. of Boss Talk 101. What a boss is talk. I appreciate y'all.